Good morning for those of us in California West Coast that's burning. Uh, my name is Victoria Vesna. I'm the director of the Arts Eye Center at UCLA. And I have a great pleasure to introduce today's panel. Good afternoon to the others and good evening to yet others. And hello to people in the future who will check this out. I think this would be a very interesting discussion. Uh, I will start it off, and my collaborator, ArtSci collective member, Caitlin Bryson, will also be around to moderate and uh, talk to our two guests. Uh, Anna Dumitro uh, okay. is an artist. She's coming to us from Brighton, and she has been doing amazing work that has been leading up to this moment of the pandemic and has incredible insights, works with scientists very directly uh, and will be bringing in some insight into the whole idea of the virus fear. What does that mean? Uh, and then we have Sarah Popelka, who actually was in SciArt a number of years <clears throat> teaching um, and now is in Northern Virginia. So she comes to us from um, Northern Virginia, another whole world. It's really great to see how we all come together and try to make sense of what situation we're in. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome both of you. And thank you for looking into the virus sphere and how we can think about it in both um, the art realm, the science realm, and most important right now in the policy realm and how politics can shift our ways of perception and thinking about the uh, art and science and culture. Welcome. All right, so get started. <laughs> so why don't you please start by um, introducing yourselves. Do you want to go first, Sarah? Sure. Um, so my name is Sarah Popelka. I um, am currently living in Northern Virginia, and I work for local government in Northern Virginia doing um, data analytics, data engineering, and um, promoting digital transformation initiatives in local government. Um, you know, with the shift from shift in operations that resulted from COVID. A lot of my work recently has been related to, um, you know, doing COVID projects, organizing community testing events, um, doing data analytics to identify clusters and outbreaks um, and all of that. So I've been very tied in with COVID research recently, um, but I also, my background is more in geospatial analytics and um, the politics of scale and data-driven governance and decision-making. Wonderful, welcome, Sarah. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. And Anna, we know you well, but there's probably people who you're new to, so say hello. Um, yeah, I'm Anna Dimitri. Um, I'm an artist based in Brighton in the UK, um, and I tend to work at the interface of art and science, I guess, embedded in laboratories, a lot with bacteria, a lot with infectious diseases, um, sometimes with viruses, obviously been thrown into that more recently. Um, and also looking at the relationship of uh, antibiotic resistance is an important thing to me as well. And that that relates to climate change and relates to the COVID pandemic and all those things kind of tie in together. So, yeah. I'm glad to be here to discuss this. Wonderful. So what's on your mind right now? Give us some ideas of how you're perceiving what's going on. Because you, uh, what's interesting to me when I talk to you is how much you've looked at pandemics and epidemics historically. And uh, when I tell you, oh, it's different now, you go, oh, maybe not. And it would be really interesting if you could introduce some of that perspective, also in relation to how policy works and how it worked in the past. Mm. I mean, I, I think that's, yeah, that's what always happens. I, 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 every time somebody says, oh, this is, this is the first time this has ever happened, it's unprecedented. I can always point to a, a previous occasion when something similar has happened. Um, 
and I, I mean, I've been interested to read um, a couple of months ago about um, there was a, there was a, a flu pandemic in the 1890s that actually no one's got any samples of, um, and so we don't know if it exactly was. Um, a coronavirus, but they think it might have been a coronavirus now because the symptoms that people had were different to Spanish flu and other influenza pandemic strains. And the pandemic went on for about four years, getting less bad each year without obviously any treatments and stuff being available. But it was quite a significant thing at the time. And it's interesting how, because we talk about, oh, this is this is the, you know, life changing event and we'll never forget it. And it seems to me that we kind of do forget these pandemics quite easily. As soon as they're over, people tend to not want to think about these things. So if you look back at the 1920s, you don't really feel the shadow of the pandemic. Obviously, it's there in this kind of um in, in this kind of way that people are actually trying to grasp life more, I think, and more celebration, but also it came after the war as well. So it's hard to know which was the kind of the factor there. I've been interested in wondering what will happen with art as well, because some people say to me, oh, yes, you, your work has always been about this. And, um, you know, now people are, you know, increasingly interested in this. Will it go to a stage where people don't want to hear about it ever again? I mean, I kind of think it will go, could go a bit either way that people, some people are more interested and some people are less interested. So it'll probably be about the same as it was before. <laughs> it's kind of, kind of the situation, but that sort of stuff really interests me. And after the, after the, um, the great plague, um, pandemic in sort of the 17th century um, there was a tendency for people to commission large permanent kind of artworks or statues and grand things because they wanted to kind of feel that they had this legacy stuff so that might happen um, and also there was a, a much greater interest in the vanitas painting you know these memento mori kind of paintings and that was all very much an increasing thing so i'm quite interested in how things will go with the with the relationship of art and how the public perceive that in this in this area i think so sarah what, what are your thoughts on the current situation we we're um i guess it's very different in north virginia than in california but you're very close to our leadership and to where policy is made. <laughs> yeah, um, I agree with a lot of what Anna said about how people are thinking that, you know, this is unprecedented. And then also, I think, feeling that once once we are able to move past this pandemic, that like, you know, we'll have conquered it. And, um, you know, once a vaccine is available, it will all be over and we won't have to worry about anything like this in the future, but really the reality is that as the climate changes, as more deforestation happens, as people are, um, you know, confined into smaller and smaller spaces by sea level rising and um, land not being usable, more and more viruses are going to crop up, um, more human, or sorry, more animal to human transmission of viruses is going to happen. Um, and this very likely could be a really recurrent thing that we have to kind of accept and comes to, come to terms with as a society and not see as just this like horrible one-off situation, but rather that it's something that we'll have to adopt into our lives of continuous prevention of disease and then also continuous like management of the risk um, and management of the transmission of disease. Um, so I think that, you know, it's really challenging being, especially in this country where a lot of people kind of don't really think that the disease is real and don't um, see the immediate immediacy of it. I just came back from Kentucky. I spent a week in Kentucky last week um, and I had people telling me that I should not be wearing a mask because it was making me sicker. Um, and, you know, you have the denial of climate change and the denial of the pandemic. Um, and all of those things are just going to honestly just be exacerbated moving forward. And so if people, I, like, I think that this is a large part of where, you know, art and science and policy can all come together to um, help promote 
you know, education and knowledge and understanding of the impacts of these kinds of large global challenges. Um, and then also creating a sense of unity to help combat these challenges as well. So how do both of you think of um, visualization, the role of visualization? I mean, that's what you specialize in, Sarah, but um, you also, Anna, as an artist, deal with visualization. And where are we with that? How does it make people worry? Or does it just become an abstraction that they can't relate to, I guess, is the question. I think people are um, more likely to, like a, a single story is worth a lot of examples of data, I think, is it for people to kind of hold on to in something that could cause, uh, could lead to kind of behaviour change or something like that. So I think storytelling is important. So narratives and stories are important in my work. So I wouldn't say my work was so much about visualisation, though sometimes it touches on that or incorporates data um but I, I i don't think my work's actually around visualization but um but to make explicit uh, an issue or something in 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 an object that can can be something like starting a conversation like my quilt made with mrsa mercer the superbug that was like this cozy storytelling quilt but it was telling the story of antibiotic resistance in in bacteria um so something like that that people can kind of interact with or even touch sometimes and and these sort of tactile things that give you a sensation and because i think aesthetics are really important there's a sort of denial that science is aesthetics led but i think it is very strongly aesthetics led um in that things like um people are drawn to work with the kind of the science that sort of really you know attracts them and fascinates them and and then they i know people that love certain bacteria i know people that love plague i know people i i quite interested in it myself um love tuberculosis love clostridium difficile these abstract organisms but they're so fascinating to them they they feel a kind of obsessive fashion fascination with them and that's what they research so it's it's interesting there's this denial around aesthetics and I but I think aesthetics are really important like the idea of the sublime or something like that and and I've read a lot in the past about this idea of the rhetorical sublime so the sublime being used as a means of persuasion and things like that and I think visualization kind of comes into that as well it's this like this idea of the rhetorical sublime so it's a, a kind of you know um quite often you see these images that are very striking visualizations and and that that the it's called almost the inability of you to hold it in your mind is the thing that persuades you that this is important and significant that's really interesting um because i almost feel like with those kinds of grand visualizations um and you know what you expressed helps you understand sort of the magnitude of the situation can also dim the magnitude of a situation because our brains just can't comprehend that kind of scale sometimes. Um, and so we do our best as people who work with data and visualizing data to um, come up with you know, innovative ways to express like these very large numbers. I work a lot with big data um, and I, you know, I'll have data sets with like hundreds of thousands of records and how can you convey the importance of, um, you know, so much information and just, again, the scale of that kind of information. And it's a definite challenge because our brains just can't wrap around those kinds of figures. Um, but having that individual, those individual stories peppered in with the, those large scale visualizations, I think can really help bring it home. Um, and that's why I love a lot of the work that I do in local government is I get to have um, that kind of emphasis on, you know, the local scale, the community scale, and like the individual scale, which can help um, convey these, uh, like the effects of, you know, the pandemic, the effects of policies uh, much more personally and relatably. Whereas in the media, you get a lot of reporting, you know, at the country level. Um, and it's just, 
really difficult to relate to that and really understand the impacts of it. Um, and then also I have a habit to of critiquing visualizations that are um, posted in publications or online. Um, and a big problem that I've noticed with the pandemic is a lot of people have sort of taken it upon themselves to create their own visualizations and their own understanding of what's happening through data. Um, and there's definite benefit to that. I'm a huge proponent of citizen science and open data um, and folks, you know, coming up with these conclusions for themselves and creating like novel insights. Um, but it's also, there's a certain danger that's associated with it where um, people who have no background in statistics or data visualization are, you know, and, and there are people that have journalism backgrounds and things like that. And so they have clout and a following, um, but they don't necessarily know how to use the data that they're using and displaying. Um, and it can create a lot of misinformation and fear um, or also a false sense of security as well. And I think that that's, uh, a large part of what's driving some of the, you know, aversion to science and things like that is people aren't really, for, for whatever reason, there's been this shift from deferring to the experts who've spent years um, studying this and have, you know, the right and authority to report on it, um, to referring to like Joe Schmo on Twitter and whatever <laughs> he feels like saying about what's happening. I mean, we had a lot of things here about people going to the beach and um, like this sort of shaming people for being on the, the beach, which is kind of like the best open air option for, for being outside and stuff, which it was kind of ridiculous. And there's this whole thing of people using zoom lenses that make everyone look like they're sitting next to each other when they were actually, you know, 12, 12 feet apart kind of the, the all the people it was like quite spaced out so if you walked along the back of the beach you could see everyone was spaced out but if you use a zoom lens and zoom in it, it makes it look and the newspapers were full of stuff like that so you get this like shaming of people for daring to go out and then this persuasion to go out because you need to spend money um somebody made a very interesting uh statement on uh, on twitter or something like that the other day that basically the the current government rules here are um it, it's it you should socially distance but um but it's a uh, lower risk settings are basically where there's a, a cash a card reader present so you can spend money basically <laughs> there's a card reader in the room you don't have to distance as much or you don't have to wear a mask and you're allowed more than six people in a space if there's a card reader present <laughs> that's quite funny but also true so yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I was thinking about what you were saying with um, that, um, about how to hold the data. Uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard called it the, um, and I'm paraphrasing slightly, something like the straining of the mind of the at the edges of itself and at the edges of reason, this idea of how you can't kind of hold this stuff in your brain. And then it switches to this idea of the sublime. But I'm not saying all data visualization does that far from it. Um, so, uh, this, yeah, it's intriguing stuff. Um, and then in terms of what you said about the card readers too, like there's been weirdly like a large promotion of tourism that I've noticed as well, um, where a lot of, you know, tourism bureaus and things like that are trying to get people to come, but then also get people to distance and not really like take up space. Um, and it's really interesting if you look at Google Transit data and Apple Maps, um, tra not transit data, but uh, like how many people have um, queried directions from Google Maps and Apple Maps um, during the pandemic. There has been a huge spike in places like Montana and Wyoming and Colorado and Washington in the Western US that have great natural resources and theoretically that ability to be outside and distance um, and road trip and still have that sense of adventure and travel mm -hmm. while you know, keeping distance and being relatively safe. And then um, a very large drop off on 
uh, in like Guam and Puerto Rico and Hawaii and all of these island nations that are trying much more to restrict tourism and have um, much more of a stake in like the well-being of their population since it's a much more closed off space. Um, and I've, you know, I've seen on social media my friends posting of their road trips and their hiking trips and things like that. And it's definitely challenging um, trying to balance, you know, the, the drive to get out with the uh, sort of societal responsibility. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting stuff. Um, it, it's, it's it's kind of there's all these kind of things working together as well. There are all these different arguments and different debates, and it's so nuanced. I think it's very hard to understand, even even if you get down to um, the mask debate or something like that, the mask wearing debate. I mean, there are different opinions on all sides with with whether it helps whether it doesn't help there's some stats to say that it definitely helps a bit then on the other side I, I know infectious diseases doctors who who are kind of like you know not so sure so it's 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 very complicated even there and it's very nuanced so and I think people de definitely struggle with nuance and they struggle with um having the tools for critical thinking I mean I think I think it's, I mean, here we had the whole um, Brexit vote and there was the famous quote where they said that the public are, are bored with e experts. People don't want experts anymore. But I think they would, that was kind of focused on um, economics experts that they were bored with um, or ones that told them something that they didn't want to hear. Um, and with the kind of the infectious diseases stuff, I think over here is still quite... Um, I mean, almost too obedient. They were a bit worried that people wouldn't go back out again um, after the lockdown. It, they ended up, and I don't don't know if you had anything like that in the States, we had something, um, a scheme that was run for the last month called Eat Out to Help Out, um, mm -hmm. where basically the UK government paid half your meal Monday to Wednesday, um, up to £10 off per head if you went to a restaurant and let in, if the restaurant was signed up to a scheme. So I think they spent, you know, several million pounds on this on this scheme to pay us all to go to restaurants. Wow. <laughs> There's a strange one. So people are, people are coming up with uh, lots of new versions of this and trying to encourage um, other things, like the theatre wants the government to buy, like, half the seats in the theatre so they can run a production and things like that so they're coming up with all these other schemes around how they can support stuff but it's it's quite an interesting so you get this mixed message where you're kind of being told to go and eat in a restaurant um but also socially distance and uh, it's yeah it's kind of and then that gets quite complicated obviously the rates are relatively low but they're rising again here since since the summer and since all the holiday season so so we're gonna we've gone back to having um no more than groups of six meeting indoors um um from monday so um i have a question i'm just thinking i'm taking some notes about what you both are talking about and um this idea of having and or promoting nuanced discussions um, that sort of tend to happen, I guess, like in the humanities fields and the question of sort of how we can have these nuanced discussions that actually affect and activate change or policy making. So I'm wondering how you see, both of you see that, see that happening and if it's possible um, within the, the sort of both of your fields. Do you want me to start? Um... I, I the the thing that I'm really interested in at the moment was I had a, a really so I, I worked for a long time with lots of infectious diseases scientists um, very leading ones in the UK and one of the scientists that I work with um, Professor Martin Llewellyn was posting on Twitter trying to advertise a, a, a study that he's trying to do um, and he can't get this study moving forward because of political polarizations and news stories that um, basically give the wrong impression of the research. So um, it's it's a major trial funded by things like um, the Gates Foundation and various things. I think I've 
got that written down somewhere who it's funded by. Um, let me see that. Well, Oxford Clinical Trials and lots of different different things. I'm not sure if it's the Gates Foundation, but um, this this project that he's doing is studying this drug made famous by um, your president um, uh, called hydroxychloroquine and this chloroquine drug to sit, to test whether it's a suitable prophylactic drug. So it's a drug that you take when you're not sick for COVID-19. So you take it in advance of that. Um, being exposed to COVID-19. And what they want to find out is whether it can either prevent um, people catching it or lessen the um, infection if they get it. And he started this trial in May and they're trying to recruit healthcare workers into the trial. Um, and as I said, it's not been it's certainly not like that, you know, there's been this big story that the, you know, that this doesn't work as a treatment for COVID. We all know that it, you know, they did this, stu these studies of patients who were very sick and it didn't improve, um, it didn't improve the rates of survival at all. But there's a, there's a suspicion that it might help with this. And it's, he said, it's basically as cheap as chips, as we say in England, um, which means very, very cheap, basically free, almost free, he said. Um, and it's been used for, you know, many, many years, like 60 years or so. And it's been, it's, it's given in um, small quantities to patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, about a million people a year take it. So it's very, very safe and it's been used for a very long time when not taken to excess, which some people, I think, did in in some cases but um but in this trial the way they want to do it and he's trying to recruit 4000 people for it since may he's got 191 people signed up for this trial at the moment um which to me is like the idea of you you could test a drug that's um, that's not harmful and at the worst case scenario might help you you know might either do nothing or might help you not catch covid in the healthcare setting as you're a worker you'd think more people would be signing up for it but because of the politics it basically makes you sound like you're you're kind of siding with um you know certain kind of politics it's politically polarizing to even enter this study so you can't get people to sign up the bbc publishes things saying you know it's it's a joke that the idea that it's become in this country anyway a joke the idea that this drug could could do anything so like all his work is being kind of shut down almost by by this kind of political polarization he said and that combined with other kind of financial um so so you have people on one side wanting not to go into this because of because it, it you know it's politically polarizing it looks like you're siding with the opposite kind of side or you have this situation where with things like big pharma it's not necessarily the in their interests for a cheap as chips drug to be taken up and be used in low to middle income countries and things like that where they might not have access to the more expensive drugs so he's he's stuck in this um kind of really complex position and i was just so fascinated in how how all these things were kind of imposing on his his work and he, he said to me um yesterday he said i was so naive i didn't know this stuff would affect scientific research that i'm trying to do um which i just think so fascinating and i'd love to hear your thoughts on something like that and i mean it's it's obviously a very different situation there as well but and I think you have a right to try or something, don't you, of a drug or is that true there or? I'm not of like. Not sure about that, um, but I do know that, you know, these kinds of medical interventions are highly contentious when it's not in the interest of big pharma. And there was a, a case a while back. I can't remember the specifics of it, but I think it was um, a implantable device that would it had something to do with heart health um, and preventing some sort of heart disease or something like that and it was this like minimally invasive like very helpful fairly cheap technology um, but it was quickly kiboshed by um, big pharma and insurance companies because they just make such a profit from 
if someone does, you know, go into cardiac arrest and then need all of these additional drugs and all of the, um, the medical support that's associated with that. And so by doing these cheap uh, preventative measures, then that cuts out a very large source of revenue. Um, and so there's just, you know, many other examples like that where these drugs that could be very helpful at preventing disease are sort of put on the back burner or killed altogether um, in favor of more costly, more invasive uh, responses to disease. And you see a lot of the same thing with like policy as well, where, um, and with digital transformation and government too, where if you put in a little bit of overhead um, to, you know, improve the system from the ground up, then you're going to be saving money in the long run. Um, but a lot of it's just very responsive rather than preventative. Um, and I work for, I do a lot of work with public works departments and we deal with a lot of infrastructure. And part of it's like, it's difficult to have the um, capacity to, you know, expend the money at the get go um, to prevent issues further down the line. But there's also a lot of, you know, political will against um, doing preventative maintenance, preventative treatments, preventative things, um, because it's it can be seen as wasteful or, you know, in the case of your study, seen as like wrong or, um, you know, not in, not like, like it's, it's just very politically charged um when in reality doing more uh, responsive and um helping like clean up the mess ends up being a lot more costly and problematic so um that was something that was really interesting to me about what you said um but in terms of more caitlin's question of these nuanced conversations a huge challenge that i run into is that i'm privy to a lot of data and information that I'm not able to share because it deals with um, individual patients or individual, you know, businesses or communities, things like that. And that's all highly protected health information. Um, and it's, there's kind of this sense of like, if you only knew what I knew, like, and I wish that I could convey um, some of these aspects to people. And I think that that would help, you know, facilitate a lot of understanding and um, really help promote some of these dialogues. But because of how um, protected and, you know, rightly so, a lot of health data is in this country, um, you can't really, you can like gesture in broad terms, but you can't really have those kinds of nuanced conversations because it puts individuals at risk. Um, and I think that that's a huge challenge as well. Um, towards having those nuanced conversations. There's definitely the political aspect of, you know, kind of what Anna said. Um, if I promote this thing, if I um, have these beliefs, if I want this solution, what does that make me look like? Who am I aligning myself with by believing this way? Um, and that's definitely a huge barrier. And then there's also the, the sort of aversion to talk about some of these more like private individual medical um, and health conversations that can help, you know, it could help further the dialogues, but they just can't really be talked about. And there's also such, such a stigma around the disease as well. And in some cases it's very valid and, um, you know, some people are, making really poor decisions that put themselves and their communities at risk. But there's also a large degree to which people don't really have the, um, the ability to not like to avoid infection. Um, folks who, you know, are essential workers and have to come in every day and put themselves at risk. Um, and so then there's this, you know, there's like such morality around disease that can be a large barrier to having those conversations as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I was I was sort of bringing up that story because the reason I I talked to him when I saw his tweet was um, about the problems that he was having was that I thought that the, the arts, like getting it out in an arts kind of setting, that that issue would be a way of helping have a more nuanced debate. It's already, I think, quite a bit more nuanced than it's been on most of the, on the, um, you know, the the media that we see or the way it would be presented by the BBC or something like that. So I think, I think this, like, the arts have a role of having, a, like, allowing this complexity of ideas and actually some paradoxes to exist at the same time. Um, that the other ways of thinking don't necessarily um, facilitate in the same way. So you had talked a little bit about um, where you see or maybe don't see art changing as a result of the pandemic. I can't remember if that was in our pre-discussion or here. No, I know I did say it here. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I was just wondering if you think that there's going to, like to be some sort of renaissance that comes out of this because you know the renaissance came out mm. of you know the dark ages um, and. It, it may not be like an art renaissance necessarily, but I wonder if you think that there's going to be some sort of like enlightenment that comes out of this pandemic and the challenges that we're facing globally right now. I mean, it's really hard to say. Um, one could hope for um, some sort of um, kind of improvement, new thing. I, I sometimes wonder whether those those situations were any better if you were there or if you would have known you were in the Enlightenment at the time or, you know, if you, if you, actually, if you were actually there. I mean, we might be in a golden age at the moment. <laughs> we don't know. It's, 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 kind of, it's kind of strange. I mean, there's, there's already a lot of people, like here, it was, it was really strange. I think I t did talk about this in the pre-discussion that... Um, there was this like in the, the kind of the early stage of the lockdown, everyone was really bored and they were at home. So what did they do? Like they like the whole of the UK was sold out of white acrylic paint. Can you believe <laughs> it? Um, because everyone was painting, you couldn't get it for love or money. And people were like sewing, painting, making artworks, making photographs or whatever. Um, Grace and Perry, one of our famous sort of um, British treasure artists uh, who won the Turner Prize, he's a um, uh, quite famous transvestite um, uh, artist, potter, ceramicist, quite flamboyant. Um, him and his wife um, streamed a show from their studio on Channel 4 called Grace and Perry's Art Club and it became hugely popular and everyone basically was doing their art projects. So there was like... It turned out from like, you know, just a small percentage of people doing art. It was like maybe you had half the country doing art. And if they weren't doing art, they were doing gardening or making sourdough. So we had, <laughs> you know, it's all these kind of things that we sort of want. So I think when you people have the time, these things, they're there. It was really interesting that like when there was nothing else, there was no hope because we had, you know, the pandemic was like, full lockdown kind of thing at the beginning when people lacked hope what did they turn to they turned to art and I thought that was that was a really interesting thing I wouldn't necessarily say that all of it was good art um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know who am I to judge um, but yeah so so that that's interesting that people kind of got more of an understanding of the importance of art in some in some ways I don't know if the same sort of thing happened happened in the US or I don't think the lockdown was so strong um, I mean we literally were supposed to stay home apart from one walk a day so um, for, for like nearly a month or so I think maybe more um, I definitely noticed a lot of people getting more into art and handicrafts so much home improvement like people suddenly <laughs> realized that their house was in shambles and the entire thing needed to be completely overhauled um, but I think that there's like some degree to which, so I think that it could either spark more of an appreciation in art, in handiwork, in um, food production, things like that. Um, but it's also the people who normally have those jobs that um, have struggled a lot more to continue to do their livelihoods during the pandemic. And it's the people that have the privilege 
of having a steady income while they're able to stay at home um, that have been able to explore some of those other, um, you know, media and uh, various activities that they wouldn't otherwise necessarily be exploring. And so I wonder if that's going to cause some sort of imbalance. Um, we had this furlough scheme where um, they, the government has, I mean, they, they've gone, they went a bit mad here. They, they, they to add to the, um, to add to the eat out to help out scheme. Um, the other one was the furlough scheme. So basically if you couldn't go to work, so you would normally be laid off, the government have paid 80% of your salary for like the whole time of the pandemic. If the, if your company would put you on furlough, they've spent something like oh, well over 100 billion on this at the moment wow. um, on, on all these schemes. So um, <laughs> um, they, they've gone a bit mad on these spending money thing. They'd saved up a lot for the Brexit, um, no Brexit deal disaster fund, but um, they've spent that now. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what will happen. We'll all be destitute. Um, but yeah, they, so a lot of people actually got to stay at home. Like if, you know, if you were, you know, a bus driver and the buses were shut down, you got put on furlough and you could stay at home and companies were encouraged to pay the other 20%. I don't know if they all did, but a lot, you know, a lot of them did, I think. So, um, so it's, it, they, it was quite a broad amount of people being, you know, being able to explore these things. So that's what I mean. We had, you know, huge numbers of people getting into, into art and things like that. So it's, it's, it's quite a strange Thing. and we don't know what's going to happen afterwards they've got to try and work out how they're going to scrape back the money that they've spent now <laughs> they're working on that <laughs> um i want to circle back a little bit to um this aspect of how how viruses how pandemics potentially will be um for like on a huge upswing because of the impacts of climate change and sarah you briefly mentioned um, what happens with climate change refugees and how people, you know, will have to migrate into different places and live potentially in closer and closer proximity. Um, so I just want to hear sort of both of your thoughts on, and Anna, especially because you know so much about the history of pandemics. Um, how, yeah, how do you both sort of see the future of, of these two, um, these two huge influences on human behavior and how will that, yeah, how will it affect uh, be seen in society? Do you want to go first, Dana? If you like. Um, so, I mean, I think that with climate change and with the, the pandemic, so something I'm really interested in, what are the collateral effects of the pandemic? What are the things happening around that we're not quite aware of um, now? And I think the biggest issue, uh, or one of the very biggest issues, is what our former chief medical officer um, declared as as big a threat to humanity as climate change, which is antibiotic resistance. And I had a Skype meeting early on in the pandemic with one of my collaborators, Jane Freeman at the University of Leeds. And she said to me, Anna, this pandemic's like throwing a bomb at the issue of antibiotic resistance. It's just going to explode because basically the people with COVID infections are being given the prophylactic antibiotics to prevent them getting pneumonias and things like that. But not just that. So you, you wanted to go to your doctors and to you can't because it's shut or something like that, or they're not accepting face-to-face um, -face visitors, or you want to go to the dentist because you've got a tooth infection or something like that. They just give you the antibiotics. So this whole idea of antibiotic stewardship, which we've been working towards, which is giving antibiotics only when they're needed and only in the right, the closest we can think of to the right amounts that people need them. That's all gone out of the window during this pandemic. So the the kind of the issue of antibiotic resistance, the speed of the bacteria um, gaining resistance has been increased um, quite substantially, probably by this pandemic. I mean, there might be some other effects that we don't quite foresee as well with this, but I mean, that that's that's a big one. And I was talking to 
I was talking to um, Professor Nick Thompson at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, um, who I'm working with as well, to do with cholera. And, and he was telling me, it was like, well, you know, in, in lots of parts of the world, you just take the risk to drink the water um, that might have cholera in it, because that's the only option to you. And obviously you need to drink quite a bit of cholera um, uh, bacteria to actually get the infection. So you can have like a low amount in the water and not, not get it. Um, but, but this is a risk that's with people in quite substantial parts of the world constantly, a constant risk. And, I, and, and, and the COVID pandemic is like that. And he said, he said that, um, he said, basically, we're getting a taste of it and we don't like it. And, and, and that was really interesting. So we're getting a taste of what lots of people in the world are putting up with all the time. And we really don't like having a taste of this, this health risk situation. So I think the, yeah, I think they're sort of the, the things I'm thinking about a lot in terms of the, the future impact of the, of the pandemic and, and what we need to be really thinking of around this is as the health inequalities in the world and these are related very much to the climate stuff because, you know, some of these um, infectious diseases, bacteria and things, they, they're, um, you know, they, they thrive, some of them in warmer climates, um, in, you know, in water and dirty water and things like that. And also just, just in pollution in water, but in agriculture. I know in the United States, it's it's still, I think, legal to use antibiotics in agriculture, isn't it? They're using um, very a, terrible. Yeah, so because I, I remember going to a burger place in, in California and, and one option on the menu was the all-natural burger, which didn't contain antibiotics. And they made a special point of it, um, which meant that every single other burger on the menu contained antibiotic fed meat, which seemed really odd to me. Um, and, and I was quite shocked by it. I think 70% of antibiotic use is in agriculture in the world, is in kind of giving to animals in agriculture. Um, and and that's, that's a really significant thing as well. So we're going to be confronting all this stuff, even in the post pandemic situation. It might have it might have an, the other kind of collateral effect might be increased hand hygiene and increased you know distancing as we're all trained to do it we've probably got a generation of toddlers that aren't going to go near each other um <laughs> going to school at the moment um you know for the rest of their lives probably and um and, and that might actually reduce infectious disease um you know transfer so who knows how how it will go i think it's it's very hard to know what the effects will be but there will be effects but i mean the ability to practice hand hygiene and practice social distancing um are like very privileged things that a very small fraction of the population of the world can actually engage in uh, and those are the people honestly that regardless of what happens in the world like probably will be fine. Um, but what really concerns me is, you know, places where there's not reliable access to clean water, running water, um, places where people don't. I saw this um, headline in, I think it was the New York Times or something. I, didn't, I haven't actually read the article yet, but it was about how um, the effects of, you know, events being canceled here, um, certain types of consumerism dwindling down have caused just like monumental impacts for garment workers in uh, various places and things like that, where they have no other um, source of income, no government support, nothing else to turn to. And a lot of the places that we, you know, are impacting by our own shifting behaviors are places that will have uh, will experience those impacts of climate change first um, and will you know have more flooding and natural disasters and need to move into uh, more crowded spaces and then also places where there's rampant you know deforestation and extraction of natural resources and um, 
so many or there's been this like pretty strong link identified between deforestation and Ebola um, because these diseases that originate in animals and might just pass unseen in those um, animal populations when forests are chopped down for things like palm oil um, and these like massively disruptive industries that forces the animals into human communities where they're then there's this um, transfer from animal to human, and we get these novel viruses that we, you know, have no, we don't know how they affect us or how to respond to them. Um, and so that's particularly concerning. And then also what you said about antibiotic resistance and how that's um, going to be exacerbated by this. And there's uh, this really interesting podcast that I listened to where it was um, a microbiologist with a passion for medieval history and a medieval historian with a passion for microbiology. And they found this medieval text that um, was like a book of remedies. And they were uh, started this project where they first tried to identify which like demonic possessions were which infections because they were all, you know, bacterial or viral infections, but they didn't have the vocabulary for that back then. So everything was a demonic possession. Um, and then they tried to identify what, um, what like medicinal properties of the different cures were the ones that were fighting these infections. And then they, um, are trying to see if they can essentially revive and revitalize a lot of these cures um, to combat antibiotic resistance because many of these cures haven't been used for you know, hundreds of years. Um, and so it's likely that uh, bacteria that are antibiotic resistant now um, wouldn't be resistant to like they would have lost their resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very easy years. for them to to lose the plasmids that the because there's a cost to, for bacteria to have a a you know an antibiotic resistance gene or plasmid. Um, so usually it it kind of weakens them in other ways and stuff like that. So they don't bother keeping them if they don't need them. But they usually like resistance is there in the environment all the time so it's likely that there are some bacteria in the world that still have these genes and that that, that would have those resistance genes so i mean those things are are not necessarily an amazing solution because we can um those those bacteria might be able to kind of kind of regain that resistance to them one of the the cholera um that I'm working with with that scientist is is the oldest living cholera in the world um, and it was from 1914 from a patient in Alexandria it's still alive it's freeze-dried in the national collection of type cultures in in at London and at Porton Down in the UK um, where I'm their artist in residence which is kind of my ideal job but what's <laughs> interesting about this world's oldest living cholera it's resistant to penicillin so the thing is so you're like what hey so um it had a naturally occurring resistance to penicillin from the environmental thing from the from the molds in the in the soil and stuff um somehow there years and years and years before the penicillin the drug came out and so it shows that this you know that these resistances are they're all just out there these resistance genes that the bacteria can have and they can share them. The more environmental pressure we put on them, the more they share and 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 evolve these resistances to them. So these environmental pressures that you're talking about, like the deforestation, stuff like that, these all kind of actually impose on the uh, on the resistance of bacteria and impact that. So it increases it. Yeah. So exactly that. And temperature and um, and another point that I was going to make related to that, too, is like that solution that I mentioned um, is like looking to the past for solutions. And I think we have a really strong tendency to try to envision like what the future looks like rather than using knowledge from the past. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that has um, been really beneficial to help fight 
COVID and other things where, um, you know, we're innovating various like ventilator technologies and PPE and all of these things and like ramping up production and we're able to have this like very industrialized approach. Um, but then in combating the virus through this industrialization, um, we're then contributing further to climate change and um, destroying ecosystems. Because I mean, every time I put on a face mask or gloves or anything like that, like I just cringe because I know that I'm um, using something that was made from fossil fuels and then I'm going to contribute it back to a landfill. Um, and there's so much progress that has been made in like reducing and reusing um, and even recycling that is all just completely being undone now. And like you can't bring um, a reusable coffee cup to Starbucks anymore. You can only use paper goods now. Um, and so it's a really interesting tension between fighting the virus, which then has impacts on climate change. And this is kind of what I was trying to get at earlier with my like, um, this, my argument about sort of fixing things systemically versus doing these like stopgap um, temporary solutions. Because if we made like a concerted effort to um, curb climate change and our impacts on the earth, we would be setting ourselves up for um, preventing issues like this in the future. But we're very focused on, you know, doing whatever we can to stop the pandemic right now, which that of course is also really admirable and something that we should be doing, but in doing so we're contributing further to the greater issue. And we're almost like stealing our future to have this repeat again. Yeah, exactly. Super interesting because exactly, it's, yeah, it's just taking in like in terms of health, um, we're just taking the um, we're not taking preventative measures. You know, we're not actually contributing to yeah the, the holistic view of health. It's very like focused on this one thing, and then all of this other stuff is erupting around that, potentially causing more damage. So. Yeah. Um, I want to just, we have three minutes left. So are there any closing thoughts um, that you would like to leave us with? And also thank you so much because yeah, but any closing thoughts? Shall I go? Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I just think that exactly what you were saying about this thing about we need to look at past stuff and not forget the things that happened kind of in in history because people always go to the last paper they don't go back to the original publication and things mm -hmm. like that so i'm doing a project on doing a project on carbon capturing yeast at the moment so these are weird synthetic biology solutions which could be utopian could be dystopian you know we, we shall it remains to be seen but synthetic biology projects but i i went and bought like the pioneering text on on yeast from 1920 to <laughs> up on the history of what did they know back in those days and 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 you know looking we're looking right back at the early early history of yeast as well because it's this like thread across time that you need to draw from the past to the future mm -hmm. and try not to forget stuff on the way um and that's what happens it gets lost every time there's a new generation everyone tries to reinvent everything mm -hmm. and and i think that's a problem people don't realize that that you know 25 years ago 50 years ago 75 years ago 100 years ago mm -hmm. the same thoughts were probably had in a slightly different way and it's when you mm -hmm. go back to the pioneers of these fields actually mm -hmm. you realize how much they knew like if you look at Pasteur um, or Robert Koch, uh, people like that, like how how far in advance they were. And now with these new tools that we have, how much more we can we can try to do as well. So we're in a we're living in interesting times, which I think is like a famous curse. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, that that's um, yeah. Um, I just uh, I just hope everyone listening is. Um, is in a reasonably safe and, and okay position at the moment. Um, and I think that's the best we can hope for at the moment, globally. Yeah, um, echoing that, 
also, you know, now more than ever is the time to think holistically and interdisciplinarily about these kinds of problems and um, solutions. And that, you know, people can get so siloed in their own particular field and not think about how what they're doing um, relates more broadly. And uh, definitely these kinds of conversations are so important to have, you know, now and moving forward um, because it's, it requires this like whole, um, like whole view on a situation in order to, to see what all the different effects and impacts are and what the many different solutions could be um, to solve them. So thank you to Caitlin and Victoria and everyone for getting us together to have these kinds of conversations. And I also hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy and well. Thank you both so much for your generosity with what you're saying and your thoughts. Um, I'm My head is really kind of actually going and I would love to talk to you more about the yeast carbon sequestration because I'm looking at the similar, um, a similar thing in mycorrhizal fungi. So yeah, very interesting it's my, stuff. It's mentioned in my talk before, the, the oh, okay. one that just on. So, so there's Perfect. a bit in it about that. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Um, well, we are signing off for now. Uh, we have a laser that's up next and this video will be saved um, and will be archived on our website as well as on our YouTube channel. So thank you so much for your participation in Tiller Vibrations and Ars Electronica. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.